welcome everyone. This is the first edition of our new series, Quarter Tones, and it's really great to have you all here. It is an honor to welcome our very special guest, Leith Sadiq, is an award-winning violinist, composer, and educator, and the current artistic director of the New York Arabic Orchestra. He has toured the world and shared the stage with major artists such as Simon Shaheen, Danilo Perez, Javier Limon, and Jack Dijonet, as well as performing in prestigious venues like the London Jazz Festival, Boston Symphony Hall, Womex Expo, uh, Panama Jazz Festival, and more. He is featured on multiple award-winning albums, and his first record, Son of Tigris, was premiered at the Montreal Jazz Festival in 2016. Leith, welcome to Africa Quarter Tones. Thank you so much, Mikey. It's uh, really special to be here and uh, such a wonderful occasion, and I'm excited for this conversation. I'm very, very excited. This um, series has been a series that I have been dreaming about for quite some time. I love the idea of having a single place, um, a big tent, so to speak, that allows us to reimagine what Arabic music was, is, and what it might be. Um, and so you're the perfect person to kick this off uh, with. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. So in this picture that we have on the screen, you're holding a violin. Um, yes. When did you first start playing the violin and was that the first instrument you picked up? Um, so I started playing the violin at the age of four. Uh, both my parents, uh, Muhammad Atman Sadiq and Zainab Samar Rai are both musicians. My mother plays the violin and my father is a pianist, composer, arranger and the conductor. He's the current director of the National Music Conservatory in Amman, in Jordan. Um, and uh, from a young age, I grew up in a musical home and Typically, um, in a conservatory environment, um, the, the two instruments that you would start off at least trying and, and, um, and kind of testing the water are either the piano or the violin. And I did start with both at the same time, just to see which one I would like more. And typically, that's normal for a kid, a young, you know, young student to see what interests uh, I had. Um, from a young age, I was the kind of person that uh, my, I bit my nails a lot. Um, uh, so piano wasn't really the instrument for me because you really need to use all your 10 fingers for it. But for the violin, you only really use the left hand fingers that are pressing on the strings while the right hand is mostly holding the bow. Um, so for some reason, I remember I stopped playing the piano. It just wasn't the one for me. And I focused on the violin. There wasn't really a moment in my childhood where I thought, okay, this is the one for me. I think it was a very steady progression into, I kind of, my love for the instrument grew as I grew older. Uh, so it was a very beautiful process. And I feel like even at this stage of my life, I'm still getting to know it more and kind of deepen my relationship to the instrument. So you, you grew up in Amman? Yes, so both my parents are actually from Baghdad, from Iraq. Uh, but I, uh, I was born there, was born in Baghdad, but later on moved when I was a year old to Amman. And that's where I spent all my life. My childhood was there. I went to school there, conservatory. Um, and um, uh, then uh, after that, I traveled yeah. abroad and I finished my higher degrees uh, elsewhere. But really in Amman, Jordan is really my, I th see it as my, as my home. That's where I grew up. And did, when, you, when you're talking about the conservatory, um, for those of us who went to conservatory, um, what canon were you sort of being exposed to to begin with? Were you growing up playing uh, Chopin and Beethoven? Yeah. Um, or were you growing up uh, learning, you know, maqam? What were you, what did you grow up listening to? So, you know, at the conservatory, especially learning an instrument like the violin, you would be um, typically learning the Western or European classical repertoire, whether, as you mentioned, these names, Beethoven, Mozart, Bach, the scales and so on, because there's a very well-structured system for learning the violin in that world. However, that was my academic learning on the instrument, which is, has benefited me greatly, technically and musically. But at home, when I would go back to the house, my parents always hosted events at home, inviting singers, uh, musicians, instrumentalists, poets, and they would always perform at, after dinner or before dinner. And I would hear these songs there, these Iraqi songs, Egyptian songs, Syrian songs. And even though at the moment, at the time, I wasn't really aware of it, but I was really absorbing all that information um, and it became kind of part of my identity. But it was only later in my life when I traveled furthest away from home to the US when I was 18, 
that's when I realized that I had something really special that was part of my identity uh, that I needed to delve into a bit more and go deeper into. So it, that part came a bit later. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the New York Arabic Orchestra, which is how I first became acquainted with your work. What is this orchestra and what is your role there? So the New York Arabic Orchestra is one of the leading institutes for uh, classical and contemporary Arabic music in, in the city, New York City. It was founded by both Bassam Saba and April Centrone. Uh, it's an orchestra. It's more of an institution, to be honest with you, because it's the term orchestra refers usually to a performance group, while the, the orchestra had a very strong performance um, record. It was also a very important educational uh, place for many students in the area and even outside the state of New York. Uh, it really nurtured uh, a, a, a community of students and, and musicians who are now professionals in their fields and, and are themselves teaching and promoting Arabic music in their own careers. Um, unfortunately, the orchestra has been, of course, going for the last 14 years, but last year we lost um, the one of the co-founder of the orchestra, Mr. Bassam Saba, unfortunately to COVID, COVID-19. It was a very difficult moment for the community around the world. He was a, a treasure for all of us musically and as a human being. He was a very, very, very high level human being and musician that we all looked up to. And with that news, it was kind of struck us all as um, it was a very down moment. Um, but then the orchestra board reached out to me and asked me if I would like to take his place and continue on his mission and his legacy. And I couldn't think of a, a more a beautiful way to kind of honor his memory than to take over um, and to, to continue on that mission. So I, I said yes, of course, and it's a huge responsibility, but it's also an exciting one because I I'm myself am an educator as well as, a, as an instrumentalist, as a musician and performer. And I take education very seriously. So looking ahead to the future of the organization, my role is going to be uh, organizing performance opportunities, uh, educational programming, mentorship, um, and also social work in furthering the, um, the responsibility of what Arabic music uh, means and what, how it should live on into the next generation, whether it's in the United States or elsewhere around the world. Amazing. So I want to talk, uh, for the, since this is the first episode of this series, um, we're structuring this in a very specific way. And Leith has been very kind to oblige me. Essentially, this uh, series, Quarter Tones, is focused on performance. And it's very much inspired by sort of old school radio shows where touring musicians would come on the radio, play a little bit, uh, play, talk, play, talk, play, talk, and giving listeners an opportunity to um, get a glimpse or a listen, a brief listen into some of the music of these um, instruments. And because we're trying to explore those spaces in between and all the different types of uh, music of the Arab world, this is a perfect way to explore it. So we've asked Leith to select three um, interludes uh, to play, and then we're going to follow each one up by a conversation. So Leith, tell us a little bit about this first interlude, what it is, and why you selected it. So the first uh, piece or song for today is called Ala Shawati Dijla, which translates to On the Banks of Tigris. Uh, Tigris, of course, is one of the two main rivers that run through uh, the city of Baghdad. And this song in itself is written by Saleh al-Kuwaiti, who is a very, very important Iraqi composer uh, and violinist, too. And the song beautifully describes the city of Baghdad with its palm trees, spring nights, the Tigris River. And as somebody who grew up away from Baghdad, but always hearing stories of the city of where I was born and never really got to visit you know, my birthplace uh, until, this, until today, I haven't really visited um, uh, Baghdad. So this song, for me, it really paints the picture of what the city looks like. And I can really get inside my head and imagine all the beautiful locations that I would like to one day visit. So in many ways, I use this piece and song as a way to start a performance because it centers me into my identity as an artist and serves as a really great overture into what's coming afterwards. So that's why I wanted to start with Ala Shawati Dijin. Beautiful. So I'm going to mute myself and the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm going to start actually by doing a very short um, improvisation using a technique that I wanted to, I've been working on 
Uh, that's a plucking technique using my thumb here that almost emulates the sound of the oud or a mandolin of some sorts that also helps me with singing uh, because of the violin location sometimes on your neck it's not as easy to uh, to sing and play at the same time so for this first performance i'm going to be using this technique and also singing so you can really hear the words and try to imagine uh, as an, a spring night in baghdad على شواطي دجل مور على شواطي دجل مور يا منياتي وجد الفجر صبح وعصر على شواطي دجل مور على شواطي دجل مور يا منياتي وقت الفجر صبح وعصر شوف الطبيعة تزي بديعة شوف الطبيعة تزي بديعة ليلة ربيع يضوي البدر يضوي البدر على شواطي دجلة مور على شواطي دجلة مور يا من Thank you. Wow, beautiful, unbelievable. Um, Leith, that was stunning. So you. if you can just give us a little sense, uh, that was really, really remarkable. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to hear that live. Um, when's the first time you heard that song? Is that a song you grew up listening to? Yeah, yeah, this song definitely was uh, part of my childhood. Uh, but I never really understood uh, on what maqam it's based on, on what rhythmic cycle it's based on, anything. I just heard the melody and it struck me as having something really special about it because the maqam of the, the musical framework of the piece is on bayati, which is typically, if I can demonstrate something very, so people can really understand the yeah. concept, at least how and I imagine this song. Bef before you go into this, can you just, for the audience, explain the difference between maqam as a form and maqam as a scale? Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. The, the way that typically we think about the maqam in Arabic music is very different than your typical scale in a Western European kind of format. When you think of a scale, 
you would play something uh, uh, notes in a specific sequence ascending and descending like the following for example this is a, a minor harmonic harmonic minor scale which sounds like this okay this is something that's very common in a classical conservatory where you would learn to play it in this way yeah but we have a, a similar uh, a maqam that uses the same notes of this called nahawand however we don't play it in this same sequence as notes ascending and descending in a in a in, in that way we play it as a melody so the way we learn a maqam is exactly how you would learn a language we learn it by learning phrases and sentences musical phrases and sentences that you would use in that way or learning a vocabulary for example and then you can create your own sentences with that so the way i would play the same notes but within the context of arabic music as nahawand is the following instead of Right, so the the emphasis on the melody is very, very, very important. So, Leith, just so I can understand. So, let's say that was just using Western uh, phrases. Let's say that was A minor harmonic, right? Yes. And what you just did is you uh, played what it would look like or sound like as a maqam, right? But if I were playing with you that phrase, that exact melody that you just played, you play that in what is the equivalent of A minor, B minor, C minor, D minor. That exact phrase is taught as is. The, the shape of that is taught as is anywhere up and down the neck. I don't think I understand 100% what, like, if it's what you're asking. Mikey. Like if I, if I asked you to play um, A minor harmonic, okay. um, you would play it. If I asked you to play a sharp, a sharp minor harmonic, you would play it. B minor sure. harmonic, you would play it. Sure. Then, but you just played it as a maqam, right? Which is the same notes, but reorganized as a melody. Sure. If I asked you to move it up a, a half step, you would very easily move it up a half step. Yes, the idea of also okay. kind of modulating a maqam, basically meaning that a maqam doesn't necessarily always start from the same note every time. So if I tell you, let's play in Nahawand, which is what I played, it doesn't always have to start on this note, which is the G. Yeah. That I've yeah. on. It can start from D, it can start from C, any other notes. And as you'll see in the second uh, piece for today, it's actually one of my compositions based on Maqam Nahawant starting on C. Yeah, so a Maqam, I really see it as a living organism. It's a, it's a, it's a really, a, it's, a, it's a person sitting next to you that has their own mood, their own personality, quality. And this same Maqam can shift and move based on how you're feeling on that day too. So if I'm playing Nahawand today and I'm feeling maybe a bit, you know, uplifted because of this conversation, and Nahawand will sound a specific way. But if I play it tomorrow after hearing about the death of somebody close to me, Nahawand will sound very different. Uh, so it is not something that is kind of um, drawn and, and written in a book and, and stays that way, like a museum piece, for example. It's something that has to keep evolving and continue to evolve. Um, as we grow up with it. So that's kind of the beauty of it. Yeah. If somebody is interested in um, finding a recording um, of this, uh, this song that you just played, is there one that sticks to mind that you say, oh, this is a beautiful one that I've gone back to a million times? Absolutely. And you know what? I will actually put the link right now, I guess, if people would like who are in the call. Uh, it's, uh, this, it's called Ala Shawati Dijla. Yeah. And this recording is by Salima Murad. Okay. who is one of the most important Iraqi singers of the time. She was alive during the time of, uh, of uh, Saleh al-Kuwaiti. Uh, and she just sang it absolutely beautifully. And this has been the, the track the, or the recording that we all really learned the song from. It's the first, I mean, it's the, um, the foundation of this. The quintessential. Yeah, exactly. Okay, beautiful. Okay, I, I think I'm ready to move on to the second one. Um, so tell us, so this is an original song, Eastern Waves. Yes. Uh, tell us a little background on this, when it came out, uh, when you wrote it, and then we'll yeah. hear it. So Eastern Waves is part of my first, first ever album that I put out called Son of Tigris. 
Um, I believe we have in the second slide the um, artwork for the, for the album. This was actually part of my graduation thesis at the global, Berkeley Global Jazz Institute, where I, where I did a, a master's program. I spent a year uh, working on and studying the history, background, the phrases, the language of jazz, and trying to find ways to connect my background as an Iraqi, Jordanian, or Arab artist into what jazz is as an idiom, as a, as a, as a genre, but it's not really a genre, it's a, as a whole world of, in and of itself. And this album was birthed from that process as a culmination of my experience there. And as I was writing this music, I was thinking, how will this be a, a personal album for me? Uh, how can I make it personal? And I thought about writing my own story, actually, uh, in terms of my own journey to that point. The first movement is basically a five movement suite. That's what the album is about. The first one is called Baghdad, which is my beginnings where I was born. Then the second one is called the, um, the uh, it's called Aghati, which Aghati is an Iraqi word we say, to, it's almost like saying dude or, or my friend, uh, Aghati or something. So that is, a, I used a very a playful rhythmic cycle for that one called Georgina that really describes a beautiful uh, cafe perhaps in Baghdad and something just to resemble the beauty of what Iraq is. Third one is called The Fog. Uh, and this is a very famous Iraqi song called Fog in Nakhal. Fog in Nakhal, Fog, Yaba Fog in Nakhal. It's a very, very well known song in the whole area, in the region. Uh, but I deconstructed the song and I actually changed the rhythm a little bit, made it a bit more, a, a, a bit darker in terms of its, its uh, color and its mood uh, to resemble the war period that Iraq went through, which has basically been my childhood, hearing about the conflict that was happening there. So it's a song that we all love, and then it's been kind of deconstructed uh, in a way to make us feel a bit uncomfortable about the situation of what the country has been going through. But then the third, now the fourth movement is called Eastern Waves, which is the one I'm going to be presenting today. It talks about the journey of immigrating away from home, and it's something I think is universal. We all do it, whether it's forced immigration where we have to leave because there's no other choice like my parents went to Amman or myself traveling for to study to, to create a better future for myself and but still the, the journey feels the same you leave something behind and this piece really and using maqam nahawan which is oftentimes resembled with the mood of nostalgia perhaps or melancholy I wanted to write a piece that um, has ups and downs about that uh, the feeling you have on an airplane when you're going away like you feel sad about saying goodbye to your parents, you don't know when you're gonna see them again, but also excited for that future ahead. So, and then the last movement, which we're not gonna be playing today, is called um, Unshakable Roots, which is wherever I am in the world, wherever I end up, my roots are always gonna be uh, the same. And to rejoice in what it means to be late and what it means to be an Iraqi Jordanian or Arab artist. Beautiful. Um, okay, so let's hear a little bit of Eastern Waves. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. 
Leith, wow. Uh, wow, absolutely stunning. Um, Thank you so much. It's, um, it, you're, you're leaving me speechless. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about um, the composition process. Mm. How do you go about writing something like that? You know, it, was, it wasn't easy at first because I was in a jazz program. So typically when, you, when you're coming from a, a, um, a musical idiom, like let's say Arabic music, that is very heavy with, within the mel melodic context of it. Our melodies are very, very strong. Uh, but then we don't really have the use of harmony in terms of chordal harmony, this vertical use of a chord doesn't exist as much as part of our idiom. So I was really focused on that at the program. I wanted to get the full knowledge of how to utilize certain seventh chords, ninth chords, 11th chords, harmonic complexity in the pieces. So I started from that point of view. I thought about the chordal progression I wanted to use and how that can influence the piece or the, the whole suite. But then after doing that for a while, I realized why am I trying to not, to not be myself? Why am I trying to be somebody else um, and, and coming into myself from far away? Why don't I start from within? What is the most important element in the Arabic music? It's the use of the maqam, which as we said, is a melodic framework. So melody, people connect to a melody a lot more than they will connect to a harmony, at least in my view viewpoint. So I went, I flipped the whole approach. I, I thought about just to write a melody, simple melody, just on the violin, no need for anything else with it. And that became the foundation of the composition and everything else was built on it. If you hear the album, by the way, if you hear the music, it's not really how it sounded now. I'm really interpreting it differently because I'm playing it as a solo now. There's a piano involved. It's really a quintet. There's piano, double bass, tenor saxophone and percussion uh, with me. So it's a really full sound. The whole suite goes through a lot of changes within it. Um, but the, the compositional process really came from a melodic point of view. And what was really special also, Mikey, in that the musicians who played with me on the record, most of them were not from an, an Arab background, but they were really curious about the music. And they put in a lot of time in learning about the culture, not just about musical things. They wanted to learn more about Iraq, the history, the rivers, the, the, the politics of it and everything involved about the country to really execute the music well. So it's, it was a very fulfilling uh, process for me as just a person. I, I felt like I grew as a human being out of this whole um, musical experience. And the, the even more beautiful thing about what connects jazz and Arabic music is the improvisational element of it in the sense that every time you perform the same piece, 60 or 70% of it is gonna be different. And that's really a human thing that we're never the same today or tomorrow. Our beliefs change, our identity could sometimes change, and that should also be reflected in the music um, and, and in the way we live our life. So this has been really the process. Beautiful. Um, I'm curious, so when you sit down, there's a question I think I asked Tarek Yemeni at some point. Mm. When you sit down with uh, collaborators who are not coming from this, this sort of uh, genre, um, what do you hand them? Do you hand them sheet music? Do you hand them charts? Mm. There's no chord changes. Uh, you know, what do you hand them? Yeah. So in this academic environment, let's say, yeah. typically you would hand them notation, a, a chart, a written out notation of the music, everything super detailed with all the markings there because you don't want to get an F on your, <laughs> on the, on your graduation paper, let's say. But I would say that in when I performed this later on outside of the academic uh, kind of uh, environment, uh, we didn't really start with notation. We started by learning the melodies by ear. Why is that? Because typically this music or much of the music from the Eastern part of the world, and even if you think in the West before the introduction of notation, music was always taught orally, right? It's passed down generation to generation. And in many ways, this is it should be still a huge, an important part of how we teach this music because it's all about the idiom, it's about the language. You learn, I'm learning Spanish now, I'm almost fluent, not because I went, I didn't go to one classroom where I learned Spanish reading a book. It's practicing it with my wife, who's a Spanish speaker, being in Spain with the people outside, it's all oral and that's how I learned the best. And music is supposed to be taught orally, that's the most natural way that we can learn. 
Um, so always starting from that format and then using the notation as just support, uh, yeah. whether it's from a harmonic point of view. And it, interestingly also, Mikey, in that when you give people a melody, one day when they learn it by ear, they might come the next day and play it slightly differently because they maybe forgot a bit of the details in it. But that's not always negative because that can give you ideas for how the melody can transform and evolve. Instead of it, if it's on paper, if it's a canon written in a book, then that's almost be becomes like the law. Like you cannot really change that note because Leith chose it to be this specific one. So yeah. there's a beauty in that. And I think that the moment we structured Arabic music in 1932 at the Arabic Music Congress in, in Cairo, when this maqam was thought of as notation written on a, in a book using Western notation, in many ways that I think hindered the, the, the fast progress of what a maqam is, that evolution of it. Because when we think of bayati now, or a maqam, for example, the, of the first song I played, we think of it as a, the melody that I would play it in the framework. Mm -hmm. But who's to say that if there was no written notation, that, that where we notated this framework, in 20, 30 years from now, where would, how would bayati sound like yeah. from one generation to the other? So it's an ongoing debate whether notation is a good thing or a bad thing. It's a balance that yeah. I think works in many situations. You know, I think the, the best analogy, I grew up playing music and I used to, I think, you know, the, the notation on the page is, is gospel. You have to follow the notation on the page. Um, I, I've since had to unlearn this. And there, when I started unlearning it was when I started learning dance and realizing there's no notation for choreography. There's no notation for dance. Um, and so when you learn, when you learn to, when you learn choreography, it's, it has to actually be reproduced for you to learn it. There's no script. You, you don't learn the choreography written down. That, that doesn't exist. Right. Um, and it is always a living process. And it's always imperfect uh, when you learn it. And it's always imperfect when you uh, reproduce it. Yeah. Um, I guess all other yeah. forms of arts are also dealt with the same way, whether it's yeah. theater, whether it's uh, painting, you learn by copying a master, by learning from somebody who is teaching it to you the method of doing it. And it's not just something you read in a book, but music has been shifted to a way where you write down the notation. Uh, and this ho often happens in, in certain organizations where they ask, you know, they want to diversify their programming by including Arabic pieces and songs and they ask for notation but the notation is just 10 percent of what the music is really what's about because it's not just about the melody i can play for you now um let's say zuruni kulli sana marra right which is a very well known uh, song by say darwish but without any of the ornamentation and decoration of it and it would sound like this It sounds like a national anthem of some random country. But then when you add this unwritten things that you have to learn by listening, by absorbing the music, the same melody becomes like this. You see how much life was birthed into the melody immediately? So this is a topic that it's very important, and that's why notation is not always the answer. Okay, um, this brings us to our our final um, our final interlude. Uh, so tell us a little bit about this. So I, I thought about you know when you asked me, Mikey, about what to present as the kind of finale of uh, of the of the talk. Uh, instead of choosing a piece of music that I I wrote or something that I was inspired by. I wanted to actually do an improvisation for you, a very free improvisation, because as I mentioned just a, a few minutes ago, the essence of this music is the improvisational aspect of it. Um, this music evolved through improvisation. We look at uh, old videos of Um Kulthum, the great Egyptian diva singer. Um, there were moments on stage when she would do something called tafarid, individualization, when she would get off script a little bit because the audience are really hyping her up, right? Like, give us more, give us more, give us more. And she would get off the script and start to, on a, maybe a letter or on a note, do these different alterations of the melody in different maqamat. 
And those recordings were really the, the way that we have learned about maqam and about the ways to improvise, to modulate, to shift between different moods and colors. And as I mentioned, a maqam is a, I see it as a living being, as actually a person sitting right here next to me. I can have conversation with many maqamat at the same time. So I thought that to culminate is to present a taqasim. Taqasim, by the way, the word means to divide into pieces, uh, meaning that even if what you'll be hearing is something that is completely free and in the moment, and I've actually haven't prepared anything, it's going to be just purely what happens now, based on my prior knowledge of the music, of course. But in my head, I am in the moment structuring something that has a specific arc. And that's why the word taqasim is used to divide into pieces that give or paint a specific story that you can follow from beginning uh, to an end. I'm going to be using, I don't know how many maqamat, perhaps I'm going to go to between five, six, seven, depending on what happens. But I thought that would be kind of a nice way to finish the Beautiful. performance segment. I await with bated breath. Go for it. <laughs> All right.
Laith, amazing. Um, that was absolutely stunning. Thank you so much. Um, I want to run into the quick Q&A. Uh, that was uh, really, really remarkable. So let's do four quick questions and then open it up to everyone else. Um, so I'm sure that you are constantly listening to music, but uh, if you're listening to something right now that you can recommend, that would be great. So what are you listening to right now? Well, my, you know, my playlist <laughs> is really crazy because when you are so deep in a, in a specific style of music that it's oftentimes good to escape from it every now and then because you don't want to be a kind of get stuck in the same sequences, phrases and lines and because you start repeating yourself a lot, mm -hmm. um, especially when you improvise. So actually it's, it's um, I listen to a lot of, of, um, of Western classical music. I listen to a lot of symphonies, Mahler, Shostakovich. Uh, I listen to a lot of Bach uh, also. But also I listen to um, Chance the Rapper um, a lot. I really, really, really enjoy listening to, to written kind of, to, it's not really, I don't really see it as rap, it's, it's poetry. I listen to poetry, yeah. really creative, um, social, um, kind of uh, backdrop to it and uh, uh, beautiful rhythms and so on. I, I really enjoy listening. I'm a, I'm a huge Chance fan. <laughs> this yeah. makes me so happy. <laughs> yeah, I, I really, that's when I go for walks or when I just try to get away from this, I listen to those types of, of artists that, and see how, how that music affects me and how I can bring in something that is yeah. also of a similar nature to try to connect things a bit more. I also listen to flamenco a lot, of course, being in Spain and having been yeah. exposed to that a lot during my career. I really enjoy that music and the connection between Andalusia and the Arab world. So it's a really mixed bag of things. Um, and there's not really one specific style. Sigur Ross is another band I listen to a lot. Uh, the Scandinavian uh, band yeah. uh, really created with uh, audio design and instrumentation orchestration uh, using bows on the guitars, you know, violin bows on their guitars. And just I, I listen to groups that are trying to push the boundary of a certain style or aesthetic in a sure. way and maybe have been successful, but doesn't have to be successful because sometimes yeah. success comes later in your career. But if you're pushing the boundary with the right intention, then that's what matters. Okay, I'm gonna get you to go through these quickly. So who yeah. would you love to shadow for a day past or present? So it's, it's difficult because there's of course, many people that you would like to be kind of uh, close to. Um, so there are two. Uh, I would either uh, pick uh, Zakaria Ahmad, the great Egyptian composer who wrote for many, many, many artists. Just want to see the process of writing um, a door or um, a qasida uh, or a composition to see kind of what, what goes through this person's mind. Alternatively, I would also like to shadow for a day uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, another great Baroque composer uh, who also improvised a lot uh, in what yeah. he wrote. Um, just kind of, I know they're both musicians, but Again, this is my world. I, they, they, they were also musicians, but also did many things outside of it and kind of being around people that lived their life, not only music, but uh, uh, that was uh, uh, just a, a huge part of their identity. Sure. What do people most misunderstand about your work or your line of work? Um, I think for artists in general, um, you know, pe people oftentimes see it as an, an entertainment kind of business, which it is, that's completely a, a true fact. We are in the business of, of entertaining others, but they also misunderstand that um, we have a really, really huge social role in education. I mean, my, I have really focused my career, not just to perform, uh, but also to give back to my community, which was kind of what led me to go to Lebanon two years ago and visit the Kayani Foundation School for Syrian Refugees and to work with students and to teach music and to, show others that there's a there's a, a larger path in their life so I think people view you know musicians as some kind of we are the, uh, the lower part of society we don't contribute as doctors do perhaps as engineers do or other fields but in many ways and what the pandemic has really showed I think many <laughs> um, groups of people have were able to be mentally well and and physically well because of art being present whether it's through movies sure. through social media through online concerts and so on. So I kind of is pushing the idea that art is, 
artists are social workers and not just entertainers. Absolutely. Um, what artist from the past would be your dream collaborator? Um, again, there are two that I, sure. that I kind of um, that I thought about. Um Kulthum, definitely one. I mean, who wouldn't dream of uh, playing on the same stage and, 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 and playing with Um Kulthum? Uh, but another one was Tupac, actually. Nice. Would be another artist because I, I don't know what kind of stuff would have come out with Maqam and kind of the, 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 um, the language that he was writing in the musical language. So that's, uh, I used to listen to him a lot as a child, to Tupac, also this, uh, his, his songs. And so that's the second one. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have a question from, in the chat and I'm going to read it out. It's actually from my mother, who is a music oh, teacher. Um, let me pull it up. Um, the question is, um, so the question is, are the recordings of the New York Orchestra um, that can be found that, and I'll add to that question, how do the recordings of the orchestra sort of uh, differ from the solo performances? Um, so for the orchestra, there are recordings on YouTube if you just type New York Arabic Orchestra. Uh, since I took over the position about six months ago, very recently, actually, we haven't had the chance to hold a performance yet to record some videos along with, my, with me and my repertoire and my ideas. But we have a presence on social media um, and the, it, it, it wouldn't, you know, solo performance wouldn't differ so much from a, an ensemble because the idea of an ensemble playing together is that they should sound as a unit, as one unit. So you will, if you hear an orchestra or a solo performance, you'll hear similar elements uh, in, 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 the, in the performance itself. Uh, and hopefully, if you do check out the social media soon, we're going to be having a lot more, whether it's on my personal social media, which I can put now my, my Instagram and Facebook tag uh, in the chat. There's a lot of different recordings there. Great. So, um, and Jani, okay, I'll ask her a question for you. Um, what do you envision as the future for Arabic music? Um, that's a really loaded question. But I think in the past years, this music was always seen, at least by younger generations, seen as the music of our grandparents. And, you know, Um Kulthum, Abdul Wahab, those really immortal names that were from the previous generation. But I think nowadays there's a group of young people, including myself, who are trying to portray an image of the music that is still young, fresh, and um, it, it can collaborate and connect with other styles. And this is, of course, the, the fusion of the music with other styles has been happening since the beginning of time, maybe it wasn't recorded in a sense as we have it today on social media. But the most important thing for the music today, for the future of this music, is the research element of it. Because as much perf of performance skills we have, recordings, videos, Unkulthum, names, Abdul Wahab, Salim Murad, uh, Sabah Fakhri, Wadi Asafi, all the important big names, research is still at a very low level. There's very few books written, that most of them are good books but still very few that delve into smaller detailed topics within the music. So the performance level is really high, but the research we still haven't scratched the surface. So I think this would be the oxygen plus the educational opportunities that I have been providing and others have been providing to engage the youth and diversify schools around the world to not only teach Western classical music in their environments, but to include other styles from other regions in the world. So we have another question from Faltman. Um, the question is, do you think there ever comes a time when it's, quote, too late for a person to begin learning the violin? And then I'd like to add to that, what is the best way for a musician uh, who is familiar with Western music to start learning Arabic uh, classical music? So for Fatima's question, I don't think it's late at all, because I used to, at some point in my life in Boston, I used to teach the Mexican consul general. I used to teach him violin. He was an older gentleman. And he picked it up and he used to spend time and practice and he was very you know disciplined with it it anything i think requires time and discipline if you can put in both into something then you will get results um and for the second question mikey is um if you're already a classical or a trained, i'm clearly i'm clearly asking for a friend <laughs> <laughs> uh, the best way is to listen to recordings and transcribe transcribing meaning to emulate what you listen to on the instrument first before asking for notation. Then the next step is, of course, working with a, a teacher, a master musician who can teach you the language back and forth by phrases. And that's how I learned with my teacher. 
Simon Shaheen. But it's never too late to learn, really. Everybody who is willing to start, find a teacher, find an instrument, and just go for it. If you can put time and discipline, you will, I promise you, you will get results. Thank you so much, uh, Leith. This was really a beautiful start to what I hope is going to be a beautiful series. Um, and as I mentioned before, this conversation will show up on our podcast. Please uh, subscribe. We're trying to build out the number of people who are listening to this podcast, sharing it. So if you enjoyed today's talk, go to our YouTube page, go to our podcast, make sure that you subscribe and you share it with your friends. Um, the more people who show up to this, the, um, the more diverse the types of questions are, and we all benefit from a diverse library and a diverse set of perspectives. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, Leith, this was a real honor to have you on the series. We have another conversation tomorrow with Anissa Hello, who uh, the, the world famous uh, author, uh, chef, and uh, restaurateur. So that's going to be a really uh, exciting talk as part of our Matbakh series. Enjoy your day, night, I wherever you to, are. To tell Elisa, who asked a question that I wrote them down the names of, she asked for artists, violinists, who they could check out. Um, and I put down three names just very quickly. Jamil Bashir, Iraqi artist, Simon Shaheen, Palestinian American artist, and Abboud Abdelal, Egyptian violinist. There's, of course, many, many, many more. Uh, Anwar Mansi, I'm writing them down now. Um, Sami Al Shawa. So just quickly copy and paste those names before we end the call and check them out on YouTube. There's some really great, great material there to learn from. Thank Inshallah, you. we can have them on the series. Uh, well, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Most of them are actually <laughs> passed away. Maybe Simon Shaheen would be great. Uh, yeah. If you can have Simon on the series, would be a lot of knowledge that he could, he could provide. Yeah. But thank you, Mikey. It's been a real yeah. pleasure to be here, and I look forward to seeing all the other coming sessions. It's great, great, great stuff that you're doing. Okay, thanks so much. Bye, everybody.